On today's show, Media Day has now come and gone for the Atlanta Hawks, and there's plenty to discuss as train camp begins on Tuesday. We'll touch on all of what was said into microphones and more coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1559 of the Lots on Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Monday evening into Tuesday. And today's show is brought to you by the folks at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use promo code Lots on NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase with Game Time. I also want to say at the top of the podcast, as always, make us your first listen each and every day. Please check us out and subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts. Places like Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, also YouTube on the video side, and. Media Day has now come and gone for the Atlanta Hawks. I was in attendance today, Monday, October 2nd, as uh, the majority of the NBA began the season officially with Media Day. And if you're not familiar with this concept, basically guys come in, uh, GMs, head coaches, mostly every player, unless they have a hugely um, nice excuse, unless you're James Harden, I suppose, comes and talks to the media in a designated location all at once. And it's a whirlwind. A lot happens. Uh, and I, don't, I know in the Hawks case, they also do a lot of their promo shoots that same day. Guys do the sort of car wash with local radio and NBA TV because it's in Atlanta. All that fun stuff happens in one day in about four or five hours and uh, definitely a whirlwind day. But alas, things are now underway. And basically on today's show, what we do, what we'll actually be doing or at least endeavoring to do is going through all of what was said that was relevant, jumped out to me. Obviously, um, there is stuff that I will not be hitting on. Otherwise, I'll be talking to you for hours and hours and hours. If you are a YouTube subscriber, you might have already seen this, or if you are uh, listening on the audio feed and are a subscriber to the podcast in that form, I am also going to post uh, basically in full the Quinn Snyder and Landry Fields media availabilities. Those were long enough to actually just kind of stand on their own. Um, I think I think Landry did about 20 minutes. Quinn did about 30 minutes. I joked about this during the availability of Quinn Snyder. I'm pretty sure Quinn could have talked for about 90 minutes. Um, there were several questions that could have been asked and were going to be asked if not for uh, PR ending things after 30 minutes, which is kind of just normal stuff. But Quinn is a talker for sure and uh, plenty to get to, of course, the players as well. So uh, a lot to touch on today and we'll just kind of dive right in at the top of the podcast. If you are a new listener, welcome aboard. First things first there. And uh, we'll endeavor to, uh, as always, cover things. And by the way, if you have missed anything over the summer, I've been talking to you in my, in my, in, into a microphone basically uh, on a regular basis all summer long. Some podcasts go dark, it's kind of dark in the off season, or at least uh, slow way, way down. We do not really do that in this space. So we've, we've covered the draft and summer league and free agency and trade stuff and schedule release and all that fun stuff. And uh, here we are, mailbags. It's all been there on the podcast. So if you're a new listener, jump on board to the archive as well. A lot of that is still relevant at this point in time. And let's talk about Media Day. And we'll sort of do it in sort of an order of what transpired as far as who talked first. Landry Fields is the head of the organization on the basketball side. Of course, Tony Ressler is the majority controlling owner. He's the one that I would love to have kind of talk in this setting, but he's not going to do that, nor does he have to. So Landry is the top of the food chain with regard to that. It's actually his first time he's ever done this as the guy. You know, last year, Landry did speak to the media as the GM, but there was the president of basketball operations, Travis Schlenk, in place at Media Day. Um, this time, it's Landry at the top. So he talked kind of extensively about habit building, and the focus there was really kind of throughout the day by lots of members of the Hawks, Fields and Snyder in particular, but even you know, even some of the veteran players. Like I think lots of talk about habit building and like organizational values and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of just in somewhat corporate speak in the NBA world. At the same time, though, it is relevant in sort of uh, the mindset and the messaging with Snyder and all that stuff. Um, Landry talks about kind of extensively his first full year in the lead role now, uh, organizational vision vision and alignment kind of throughout that conversation. He was asked about goals for the season and fields focused on the day-to-day -day process and sort of the habits and all that stuff rather than kind of declaring a definitive benchmark on the court. It struck me that basically almost no one, I, I, I intentionally say almost no one, kind of gave a definitive goal for the season. DeJounte Murray was the one exception to that, which we'll come back to later on in the podcast. But Landry kind of danced around, even I think two or three times, asked about goals and he didn't really give one. Like there was no like, we're going to do this, we're going to do this as far as like results are concerned, which is always interesting. Obviously, it's kind of maybe better in some ways to have your leadership kind of dance around that. So you don't, if you fall short, all that stuff. But uh, last year, there was lots of like, we're going to be a top six seed talk. And the Hawks did, did not, of course, accomplish that goal. But this, this year, other than DeJounte, that really didn't happen a ton on Monday. Um, 
he talks about the kind of the two new additions outside of the rookies are Patty Mills and Wes Matthews. He was talking about leadership with those guys, but also said, and I quote, those guys can still play, end quote, mentions floor spacing and, and also shooting from both guys, which is certainly relevant. Um, I asked Fields later on about Mills and kind of the depth behind Trey DJ at point guard. Talked about Mills but kind of playing the one and the two in the past and almost even leaning to the two at times. He also referenced Trent Forrest and Kobe Bufkin as potential lead, lead guard options if the Hawks were to need those guys. But certainly, that didn't really dispel any of the um, questions. Like, again, it's good that both DeJounte and Trey are, are durable players who expect to kind of play 70-plus games. But they don't really have a perfect third point guard on this team. They have guys who can play there. Again, Mills. Um, maybe Bufkin, uh, Forrest is more of a defensive point guard than an offensive point guard. So they have options, but nobody that you, I would love, if even if you get like an injury for two weeks to DeJounte or try something to keep an eye on. And uh, Larry didn't really like you know, fully answer that question. He did kind of acknowledge that you know, the loss of Collins is out there. Huge part of, the, of things that they've been doing in the last couple of years, particularly on defense last season, which he talked about, which I was actually glad to see because I always thought that Collins was underrated defensively. But he did mention the progression of Jalen Johnson as a defender that they, that they saw kind of happening last season, something that they're, they're quite excited about. I know Hawks fans are excited about that as well, as they should be. Phil talked about the movement in the Eastern Conference, saying that it's great for the league and great for the Hawks, which is, you know, I'm sure that it's pretty interesting to kind of hear. But he talked about that being a, kind of making the team more hungry. Um, this is a very obvious topic, but also one that is uh, not really terribly easy to talk about in public. And that is the extension talks for Sadiq Bey and Aneka Kongwu. Fields said what every single GM says here. Um, he was asked about whether it was going to get done or not. And he said, essentially, they're trying to get something done on both fronts with both guys. And that's just kind of what you have to say. <laughs> we'll see. Um, that's one of the storylines that I'll be following in a couple of weeks more often than not is uh, kind of who gets done or neither out of those guys. Um, I've talked about this before, but just in short, um, any rookie extension, which is these are the two guys who are eligible for that, has to get done before before opening night actually happens. And in the last couple of years, the Hawks have had guys go down to the wire. Kevin Herter, two years ago, the Andre Hunter last year, got done. The year before that, John Collins did not get done, and then he ended up, he ended up signing um, once he actually hit for agency. But all that said, um, something to circle for the next couple of weeks to monitor. Um, he did talk about the rookies a little bit and uh, kind of said that they have a lot of guys coming back playing rotational minutes last year, which is kind of the elephant in the room of this entire season is that the Hawks are kind of running it back in some respects. Now, I'm not in full. Um, of course, you're trading John Collins for essentially nothing when it comes to just a salary dump and um, kind of clearing the books long term is a selling point there. But that doesn't really make you better in itself, but the Hawks are kind of banking on internal improvement, which is something they talk about a lot up and down the uh, list of guys today who talk to the media, just kind of guys getting better, um, young guys getting more mature, all of that stuff. Um, but even with regard to like playing time for the rookies, Landry kind of didn't like say they're not going to play, but I talked about this quite a bit already. In my view, I would urge people to um, expect very little on the court in the NBA from the rookie class this year, which is Buffkin, of course, the first round pick, but even Seth Lundy, Muhammad Gay, Miles Norris. Um, you know, Buffkin could get on the floor, obviously. I think Seth Lundy kind of profiles as a guy who could play a little bit easier than Sung because he's an older guy. But this is a team that has a lot of functional depth. Even like someone like Seth Lundy could play in a lot more teams, but this Hawks team has like a couple of guys, you know, Garrison Matthews, Wes Matthews, who are not going to be necessarily every single night players, but like would be ahead of the rookies as far as like playing minutes today. So anyway, that was interesting to kind of, kind of hear from Landry. And uh, last thing here, I'm going to play some uh, video for you at the end of this. Um, Landry was asked by me about improving the roster, kind of the fact that the Hawks didn't really do a lot in the offseason. There's also a follow-up question about Siakam in particular. So here's that video from uh, Landry. Again, this is me asking first, then a follow-up after that. And Landry feels talking about the roster as it stands right now. You talked about kind of the East getting – better and uh, lots of player movement there. Obviously, there's always the, the rumblings around transactions all summer long, and you end up not kind of making the big splash move this summer. How aggressive will you be to potentially upgrade the roster, especially coming off of a, of a playing appearance, which I know obviously is not going to be the goal for this year? Yeah, it's, I think, for more from a philosophical standpoint, like it's something that we're always going to look at. It's my job, it's my group's job to be scouring the land and figuring out how can we continue to improve this roster. Um, but sort of the, the theme and the common theme right now, especially right with what we're doing is just seeing how this whole system takes shape and the guys that we do have. And then if we need to make adjustments, we'll make adjustments. But 
Um, it's something that's always in the back of our mind, something that we're always looking at. And if there's opportunity, like we'll, we'll try our best to do it. Piggybacking off that, Landry, there was a lot of smoke and rumors around a particular player that we were going after uh, in Pascal Siakam. What is your response to, to those rumors? Uh, sort of similar to the last question, like we're always going to be looking at opportunities to improve this roster. And whenever there's guys that have their names in the mix, you know, sometimes it's just it just is what it is. And, you know, you don't really have to address anything because like that's the nature of the NBA. But then there's other times where if there's things that come up, we do do a good job of communicating with the players and their agents saying, hey, this has come up right now. Could be something, could be nothing, but more than anything, we don't want you to be blindsided if something were to happen. Because in this day and age, I mean, how fast you guys learn of certain things is quicker than what we do at times. So um, that's the approach that we take in those certain scenarios. So you hear that there, obviously, uh, no surprises, like talking about including the ro- including and looking for upgrades and opportunities to improve the roster. That's a very normal thing to say. I just asked the question to see what he would say, honestly, but uh, he did acknowledge, again, that they're trying to monitor the system. And again, they're kind of banking without saying it this plainly. They're kind of banking on the magic of Quinn Snyder to turn this team into a team that they want it to be. Like, again, they were in. This is a very simple way to put it, but they were in the play in last year with a roster that uh, kindly could be said is very similar to the one that it is right now. And again, you could argue it's worse, if anything, because you're trading John Collins for nothing. So they're hoping to get boosts from not just the young, like the super young guys. Obviously, Jalen, Onyeka, and AJ are the guys who were like clear step forward candidates. But they also need more from DeJounte Murray. They need more from DeAndre Hunter. They need, I mean, you could argue even Trey, who like I, I think has still underrated at this point in time. He didn't have a great year for him last year. So there are guys who have to take a step forward. Sadiq Bay was going once he got over on offense, but even defensively got to improve there. So like there's there's areas for improvement, but they are banking internally in the, I think Saturday at the top of the list there. And a good reminder there. Also, there, I noticed there was some reaction online to Fields not really acknowledging the Siakam part of the question. That's just kind of be, to, be, to be expected. I know this is something that's not everyone's like plugged into, but you're basically never going to hear a, a GM at Media Day talk about a player on another team as far as like a potential trade candidate. I understand that Landry, Landry certainly knows that that got out there. It was very public that the Hawks were looking at Pascal Siakam, but he's not going to like talk about those negotiations if they're even happening now, which I don't they probably are right now. Um, as a sidebar, uh, the vibes in Toronto are not looking great right now. Siakam kind of had some interesting comments today at Media Day. So did Masai Ujiri. I don't know if that people kind of asked me if that was going to rekindle things. I don't know. It would not surprise me if the Hawks got back into the Siakam Derby or if they never left the Siakam Derby. But for now, that's where we are. And again, no surprise that Landry is like leaving the door open. But at the same time, no one's going to like tip their hand and say, yeah, we're looking to make a move right now today in training camp. Um, I think that probably the most common sense scenario here is that the Hawks will go into the season as they are now, see how they play. If they're playing well and they're on track to be, you know, a buyer potentially to kind of improve and maybe try to act like a, they're a top four or five seed in the East, then you might see a buy move at the deadline or around them. If they're kind of floundering, um, maybe more organizational moves uh, later on as far as like overhaul, that kind of stuff. So a big year in a lot of respects, which we'll talk about a lot in the next couple of weeks, I'm sure. And then beyond that, of course. But uh, for now, that's kind of where we are with Landry. No, no huge bombshells. And look, to be candid with, with the listeners and viewers of this podcast, there was nothing massive from Hawks Media Day. There were other teams around the league that made bigger splashes. You know, James Harden not showing up, um, the stuff I mentioned in Toronto, um, et cetera, like new guys in new places. The Hawks didn't have that huge move. Last year, it was all about DeJounte Murray. He had just come in. They, they paid a huge price for him, all that stuff. This year, it was much more on the margins and bringing back Quinn and all that stuff. So there's Landry, and we'll come back in a second and talk more about what transpired at Media Day with Quinn Snyder and the players, et cetera. But first, they were from our sponsors on today's show. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. You should never have to worry about when you're buying tickets to a big event. And with Game Time, you actually never have to. Game Time has last minute deals and tickets for football and basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. It's incredibly easy to navigate to find all the tickets that you're looking for and actually buy them for any event in your area. They have zone deals as well. Pick the section and Game Time actually picks the tickets for you for an average of 18% savings on those deals. And at Game Time, you can see the view for all the seats in the venue that you're actually looking for. That lets you know exactly what you're getting. And what you can expect when you arrive to the venue, they have all in pricing. So you know what your total is up front without any of the hidden fees that some services have. And you have peace of mind with game time as well. The game time guarantee means you'll actually get the best price. If you can buy tickets in the same section and the same row for less, you'll be given 100%, 110% of the difference from game time. Take all the guesswork out of buying tickets by using game time right now. 
Download the app. It's game time and your favorite app store. Create an account. Use the promo code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase with game time. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem the promo code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, we'll dive in now to Quinn Snyder and, of course, the players coming up after this. But first, sitting on the table with a little bit of video for you slash audio if you listen on the audio side from Quinn. It's actually his opening statement um, today in, in advance of his 30-minute availability. Uh, he kind of went back and forth with the head of PR, Garen, about whether he had to actually give an opening statement that actually was pretty eloquent. So I'm going to play this for you. Quinn kind of setting the tone for the season, and this is what he had to say. Well, obviously, on the, you know, the day before training camp begins, you know, there's – crescendo of enthusiasm um you know as you head into camp and it's been a good summer for us i think we've had a lot of contact with our players um touched our players a lot you know people have worked um we've worked collectively and you know excited to to get going i think this is a group that um you know last year having an opportunity to kind of feel and experience this team um you know, a few a few things happen in the summer that, um, you know, that you think about, respond to, you know, try to continue to develop basically plans and a path for a team to uh, to get better throughout a year, um, and mixing together that that urgency and desire to to be good, you know, from day one on, and with kind of the the also the the realism involved and. The fact that growth usually isn't linear and understanding that we're going to have some some challenges along the way and to embrace them. So um, all those things kind of woven together right now. I have to say shouts to Robbie Cowan for the quote of uh, growth is not linear. That's a Robbie special who's been on this podcast many times. But, um, you know, obviously they're bringing back the same group, Sans Collins, for the most part. And uh, the fact that Quinn even references, as I said before the break, a lot of the improvement and development needs to come internally. That was a quote from Quinn Snyder, which obviously makes a lot of sense if you're just kind of paying attention to this stuff, but worth hearing out loud. He did say that last year was valuable in a lot of ways for the Hawks. He did acknowledge, though, that sort of the head start narrative on putting the system in place didn't really happen for Snyder. It was more about evaluation. And as far as system stuff is concerned, like how putting his own spin on things with a new staff, all that stuff, he said they're starting that now, essentially. And uh, he did say that he wants hard work to be kind of characteristic to the system overall. But, um, he, you know, he talks about glowingly, I would say, his new staff. And he said this is the thing that he actually, actually has the most control over, which actually I hadn't really thought about that. But it makes sense. Like he has complete control over who he hires around him. He's excited about the group. He talked about it being diverse and relational. He has former players like Ekpa Yudo and Antonio Lang. He's got a former high-level college coach, Mike Bray. He's got long-time assistants with Quinn. Then he went back to Utah. He spoke really highly of Brittany Donaldson. Um, very positive, glowing about the staff in general. And also talked about this kind of interesting story, how he knocked down some of the walls at the facility that kind of made his office smaller, but allowed other other people in the staff to uh, have a view of the court. And he said, and I quote, I don't really need an office. The court is my office. Fantastic stuff. Look what's that? Um, he's very positive on the in-season tournament, which is interesting. Uh, talks about kind of being another bite at the apple. And it's fun for the team and fun for the fans and a learning experience. Um, he referenced it kind of being analogous to a playoff setting, especially because it's going to be early in the season, kind of a nice little test. Um, the Hawks, you know, I'll be interested to see just generally speaking across the league, like who pays attention to this and also how big of a deal it is and how teams approach it. But the Hawks are going to try, it seems like, to win that. And that's interesting. Um, lots of scheme stuff. He did talk about, uh, it was actually a good, a good question, seeing, seeing him up on this, but how Quinn is kind of known in some respects as like this scheme guy, which he certainly is, but like he's not married to a specific scheme. He's like pretty adaptable. And he talked about like not having change for change shake, which I thought was pretty interesting. He talks about DeJounte working on pick and roll stuff and Trey being awesome in that regard. He wants variety, but like they're not going to just run something that doesn't really fit their personnel, which I kind of enjoy um, back and forth. Um, he got a nice question about um, kind of out of the box stuff of the preseason from Lauren Williams, the AJC. He talks about like having a very large box. So kind of like being experimental, but not being too experimental. Kind of interesting um, stuff there. Talk about spacing quite a bit. Um, spacing allowing, allowing you to move the ball. The quote was, it allows you to attack. It's subtle, but if you're spaced properly, sometimes it can be as simple as you are not in someone's way. It talks about doing something for somebody else, kind of that um, unselfishness and spacing just kind of makes it life easier for everybody else. Something I talk about a lot when I do more analysis on this podcast with Glenn Willis and other people was like, you know, let's just say for the prism of Trey Young, you know, obviously Trey is fantastic, but um, spacing around him makes life easier. And like when you're, especially when you're Trey's size, having that around you could just, you know, makes life better for you. And that's kind of the, the whole thing about spacing in the NBA is just kind of give everybody more space to operate. 
and operate effectively. Um, defensively, probably the quarter of the day for me as a defensive aficionado was the following. Quinn said, uh, after a sort of a preamble about how scheme doesn't really matter, you know, all that stuff, he said, defense has to be a decision. One more time. Defense has to be a decision, which obviously is not like anything groundbreaking, but for a team like the Hawks, that's been famously inconsistent in the last couple of years and also pretty bad defensively for the vast majority of that time, being consistent is something I talked about getting back to the summer with Glenn and other things on this podcast. And that's like the number one thing they have to get better at is just not playing down or up to their competition and particularly on defense. Defense has to be a decision. It's a pretty interesting kind of theme for the season. If I'm the Hawks, um, he talks about Patty Mills and Wes Matthews as well, being pros, pros, and the leadership stuff. Also kind of just being a lot of winning teams, which is certainly worth pointing out. Those guys are like my age, which means they're pretty old at this point in time, but very helpful. And again, end of things with talking about consistency and kind of facing adversity and doing all that stuff too. So uh, plenty to talk about there with uh, with Quinn, but um, interesting stuff. I thought he was really eloquent. And again, the full 30 minutes or so. And again, it could have been much longer. Like There were lots of basketball questions and follow-ups that I wanted to ask. Everybody ran out of time. It is what it is, but... There you go. We'll have more of that in the near future. We'll do one more player here before we get to a break. Uh, Trey Young, obviously the headliner on the Hawks roster now and for always. Um, he got an early question about how he is viewed and after being left off the FIBA team. And uh, Trey, let's just say, had a he kind of always has a chip on his shoulder, which makes him great, honestly. You know, you don't really get to where he's gotten as a guy who's 6'1 and 180 pounds without having some motivation. And Trey's always been kind of us against the world kind of guy. But he, uh, I think it was even more pronounced today. Uh, the quote is the following. If you don't think I've been disrespected, you're just not telling the truth. It's okay. I just want to go out there and keep the main thing, the main thing, and that's winning. But if you don't think I've been disrespected, you're not. You're just not telling the truth is a Trey Young quote for all Trey Young quotes. Um, he talks about being on the All-Star team last year, not being on it, and that he should have been on it, for instance. Again, um, very much a Trey Young thing. He was upbeat. like He was smiling throughout this thing. He's not like a bad mood. It was just one, one of those things where like, Trey believes in himself, and he should. And I think that he feels like he's been kind of put off. And that's, I don't, I don't blame him for that. I think I talked about this a lot over the summer. Like he should have been on, on the FIBA team if he wanted to be, also team, et cetera. He's underrated at this point in time. That's where I am. Um, he didn't get into specifics on team goals like DeJounte did, but he did say, I believe we can go as far as we want to, is the quote. And also one more later on in the availability. I feel like if we needed to do what we need to do, we'll be there at the end. So some positive stuff there, nothing like groundbreaking, but still. He talks about being more of a leader as he gets into year six of his career. Um, experience playing like full seasons and like kind of you know being in the playoffs, all that stuff. Um, good to see that from your best player for sure. Um, he talks about like the good test of last year bringing in Quinn midseason, chemistry building, etc. He wants to have shorter off seasons, which means, of course, playing deeper into the playoffs. Um, he seemed to be thrilled to have Wes Matthews on board. Wes, he actually gave him for me anyway the ultimate compliment, saying that Wes Matthews has quote Solomon Hill vibes. And if you're a longtime Hawks fan, you will know Solomon Hill was a fan favorite, favorite of mine for sure. And uh, kind of the enforcer, but the old head veteran in that locker room that Trey's still close with. Uh, he, he passed along that Wes, um, and talking to him kind of right away, said he had his back. Wes Matthews is a very tough guy, like a renowned vet. So that's definitely uh, a good partnership to have. And uh, he kind of laughed off a question about load management because he doesn't really load manage, which I, I've always loved about Trey. Like Trey always wants to play. Uh, he, and he and DeJounte both uh, kind of ready to roll. So um, upbeats up from Trey. I was nothing like huge. Again, not like he made massive national news today, but one of those things where uh, I think he's in a good headspace as the season begins. Okay. When we're right here from our sponsor today's podcast, we'll come back with the wrap up with regard to DeJounte and Clint and McDonavich and the young guys, et cetera. More of that on the way. All right, to DeJounte Murray first, and I teased it a little bit earlier, but he was the only guy who was really definitive on team goals that I recall anyway. He first said they're trying to be better than last year. Obviously, that's a, that's a goal in itself, and kind of being identified as a, you know, a team that they want to be from the jump and pointed out to basically everyone being in town like a month early, which is I think is a good thing. People were surprised by that. I was not. It's kind of what happens in the NBA these days, but it's still good to have basically your whole team around for weeks before the actual report date. But then... DeJounte mentioned in passing being a top four seed, and he flat out said, and I quote, being a play-in team is not an option. Again, being a play-in team is not an option. Now, that's like a very normal thing to say. But DeJounte, to his credit, it's like a very matter-of-fact guy. He's a confident guy. He's a good talker. But like, it's good that somebody said that because look, internal expectations, Tony Wrestler on down, like no one wants to be in the play-in again. You know, that's a big disappointment that can't be lost the last two seasons the Hawks have been in the play-in and that is not where they wanted to be you know two years ago 
weird season, all that stuff, but, you know, regression after the conference finals. But last year, it's it's kind of worth remembering, like, they went out and paid big money as a buyer in a trade for DeJounte Murray, came back and had a play-in season again. And that's, like, not where they wanted to be. So, all that said, like, DeJounte is not having it anymore. He's looking to be better than that. Um, kind of just talking about overall and culture stuff, and accountability and performing at the highest level. Of course, he signed the extension as well. He talked about that in very positive terms as he comes back and kind of commits to Atlanta. Talking about loyalty and Ajante again, like obviously wants to be here and they paid him handsomely, but still that was a, a good deal from the, from the Hawks side and some security for Ajante as well. Um, he talked about how everything begins with he and Trey, which is obvious, but also true. Um, setting the tone of unselfishness and high character and all that stuff. Talked about kind of all of that and also having fun and performing at a high level together. Um, he's actually back with Patty Mills, who he was with in San Antonio. They have lockers next to each other, which he got, I guess he wanted. Um, he referred to Patty Mills as a guy who with high energy, high character, hard worker, and infectious kind of be around and help everyone. Um, I've always heard I've always heard great things about Patty Mills. And that was something that DeJounte echoed in this space. I also heard um, I believe it was 929 the game, did an interview with DeJounte either before or after media day that I heard after the fact that he said pretty, pretty plainly that he individually has to be better defensively this year which I would certainly echo. Like, I think I probably got, um, you know, maybe painted this way accurately, but I was pretty critical of DJ's defense last year. I think it was like not acceptably good for where he needs to be like for the Hawks and also for himself, like reputationally. And just for, cause look where the Hawks are with guys like Trey and with guys like bogey and um, all that stuff. Like he has to be better. Like he just flat out has to be. And maybe that's not fair to him, but it's just the way that this roster is built. So he knows it. That's good to see, et cetera. Um, other guys quickly at the end of the podcast, Capella talked about trying to be a, a top 10 defense. I was challenging himself there and also on the on the whole. He's kind of the vocal leader of the defense, which makes a lot of sense as the center. Um, one of the longest center best on the team, of course. Um, he and Kongwu got questions about like feeding off each other and getting along well. They challenge each other and they really seem to like each other, honestly. It's always funny to have like Hawks fans go like one versus one with those guys. They actually seem to get along really well. Um, and they try to make it fun competing against, against each other every day in practice and also just playing uh, at the position. Bogey is healthy, which is also important to kind of drive home if you're just not paying attention again for the first time in a while. In fact, the Hawks, as of right now, I'm knocking on wood as I talk about this, are totally healthy as camp opens. And that's the first time that's happened in several seasons. Like it wasn't just Bogey. Bogey's been banged up the last couple of years, which he kind of talked about today. But Jalen Johnson last year was banged up all summer long. A Kongwu the year before that. There's like always seems to be a guy or two that are banged up. And right now, again, nobody's hurt for the Hawks. That's a very, very helpful thing, in particular with Bogey, because Bogey is an X factor. As I've talked about many times on this podcast, the Hawks are always their best when Bogey is his best and is healthy and look great and FIBA, all that stuff. He looks to be prepared and in shape for the season, which is a positive thing for the potential six man of the year candidate, in my mind, if I am the Hawks. Um, DeAndre Hunter got a question about, about, about three point volume. They got a lot of attention today. I'm going to read the quote that he gave to a question again about three-point volume. Quinn Snyder knows my game well. He's not going to take the mid-range game away from me, end quote. Now, that got a lot of reaction. It is what it is. He did say that Quinn wants to take more threes, which I agree with. I know Hawks fans didn't love this quote. I've always said, though, you know, guys like Trey and Ajante, but even Hunter, they're not going to just stop taking mid-rangers altogether. Now, I do believe that Hunter should take less of them. I think that he should be more of a catch and shoot three point shooter in some ways, but he did, to be fair, shoot well on mid rangers last year. It was everything else. He didn't, he didn't get to the rim enough, didn't take enough threes, etc. But like, I don't think that he is a guy that you just cross off as a mid range shooter, which, which I think is what he's kind of trying to get to. I think there's still a divide of like what Hunter is versus what he probably wants to be, but that was a uh, one that kind of made the rounds today. Um, also, he's an interesting guy in general, kind of a weird sense of humor. He got a question about what he worked on in the offseason, and he basically deadpanned it. I know Trey Kirby from No Dunks was there, and we kind of laughed about this. He, he tweeted about it too. He basically said uh, he worked on nothing in the offseason, which is obviously – that can't possibly be true, but it's just a weird moment all the way around. It was just like awkward silence. Like he didn't even clean it up. It was an odd, odd thing. And it was even funnier because in his interview, he talked kind of extensively about being more vocal this year. He's a very quiet guy by nature, but like in the middle of talking about being a vocal leader, he did that answer where he said he wasn't working on anything and just kind of went silent. It was a weird thing. Anyway, a big year for Hunter, as I've said many times before. Kind of a weird day, though, for him in general. Um, the young guys, AJ, Jalen, Onyeka. AJ seemed to be more comfortable. Same thing with Jalen talking to the media and kind of just being upbeat and confident at the mic. Um, AJ got questions about his dad up and down because his dad, of course, now is a head coach in the league for the first time. Uh, Jalen and Onyeka actually shared the podium a little bit because um, 
Anyeka asked Jalen a question as a media member, quote unquote. And also Bruno did the same thing to Bogey earlier in the day. Um, obvious, obvious chemistry between Jalen and Anyeka, who play together a lot and they're close friends. Um, Jalen did say, I thought it was pretty revealing, that he feels like he's been more like able to be himself with Quinn. Um, he's done a good job about like not burying Nate McMillan and the staff, but it's kind of obvious to me that he, I think he thinks that and he feels much better about the way he's being talked to and deployed and utilized. And look, Nate, you know, for all of this, like uh, Nate's weaknesses and all that stuff, I think Jalen is like maybe even the most extreme example of like a guy who just does not fit what Nate thinks and like well, the way Nate operates. Like Trey and Dejounte, um, can you can kind of go either way, but like you kind of need to be open-minded and like experimental with Jalen Johnson. He's kind of a weird player, not in a bad way. He's a very talented guy, but like he's not like a guy you put in a box. And I think he feels like he's out of the box now, which is good to see. Um, more, you know, again, confident next step stuff for Jalen and uh, everybody's upbeat there. Other than that, uh, I mean, Bruno talked about FIBA stuff. He like uh, that experience quite a bit. Uh, he made a joke about how he uh, seemed to be leaner, but also put on weight. He was confused by that, etc. cetera. Uh, he praised Clint Capella for his kind of mentorship, um, both when he was here before and also while he was gone in Boston and Houston. Um, Seth Lundy and Patty Mills exchanged numbers because uh, it was kind of a meme the other day when the Hawks announced their roster for training camp that Patty Mills did not have a number. And I've been saying to anyone who will listen, Patty's going to show up. There's like this, I don't even know what it is. Like, I guess it's a Hawks fan. I mean, I'm not even sure if it's a joke at this point, but like people are like thinking that Patty Mills was just never going to come to the Hawks, which was not the case. I know there was like one report by Woj in like July that the Hawks were going to consider trading Mills, which they probably did. But like once that cleared, like he was always going to show up. He's a beloved guy and uh, he has a number now. He's number eight which is his longtime number. Um, I would love to know if Seth Lundy got a few dollars from Patty Mills to give up a number that he was actually assigned previously. But Lundy's wearing number three now. All is all is fine. Patty was there. He was upbeat. And again, below a guy in the locker room. Anyway, I could go player by player. Like there was all kinds of things. Um, you know, people kind of learned today or in the last couple of days that uh, Keaton Wallace is the older brother of Kaysen Wallace. Keaton Wallace just signed a training camp deal with the Hawks along with Jarkel Joyner. Obviously not going to probably be on the team, but looks to be uh, bound for College Park as a potential interesting guy in the future. Again, brother of, Ke- of Kaysen Wallace, who is going to be who is a first round pick this year, lottery guy. Um, anyway, there's up and down the roster. Uh, I encourage you. I'm sure you can find them. I know Jamila Johnson has a lot of these videos on her YouTube. Um, you, you can find them out there. But if you want more context, I'm sure you can find it. And they were also streaming live on Monday as well. That's all I have on the player side. And uh, again, not a huge news breaking day for media day standards by you know across the league. But that's to be expected for a team that, again, didn't do a whole lot in the offseason. They're kind of banking on the internal stuff. There's a little bit of news at the end of the podcast, though. The Hawks lost an ESPN game already. Philadelphia at Atlanta on January 10th has been removed from the schedule by ESPN. Um, the timing was kind of funny. It was announced today on media day. It might've been because of James Harden, not reporting to Colorado, but we'll see. Bally, by the way, still has that game. So no concerns about not, not actually being able to watch it locally. Um, also the local broadcasts and Bally have a new sideline reporter. Tabitha Turner has been tabbed by Bally to be the primary sideline reporter this year for the Hawks. Replacing Lauren Jamara. Lauren is now full-time as a national reporter for Warner Brothers Discovery. And Lauren is awesome. Shouts to Lauren. Go blue as she is a fellow Michigan folks. Uh, anyway, she's she's awesome, but she's moving on to bigger and better things. And Tabitha played college basketball at Georgia Tech um, Been covering the dream as a reporter and analyst the last couple of years. Um, was a silent reporter for ACC women's basketball as well for Bally. Did some silent work for College Park. Like she's a um, kind of a dual role. Um, again, played college basketball at Tech. So uh, that's a, a very interesting addition. I look forward to meeting her and uh, hearing her on the broadcast as well. The rest of the crew, by the way, is back for Bally. I know folks that are not local may not care about this, but because it's the way to watch the Hawks locally, uh, you'll have Bob and Nick again, Trevor Scales, um, Brian Oliver, et cetera. And they have 80 of the 82 games this year. Um, the only two that, that they do not have are the TNT games because TNT has exclusive national windows. But anyway, there you go on that. And again, training camp opens on Tuesday, officially. Trey Young and others said the Hawks not even have really have a, uh, sort of a meeting yet officially, but they get away with practice on Tuesday. Um, again, the roster's kind of been in town. They're currently scheduled to practice the next four days. I, I think a couple of those might be two days as well. That's what happens in camp. And then they have a day off scheduled for Saturday. But anyway, the preseason opener is, as you're listening to this podcast on Tuesday, probably a week from today. Tuesday the 10th is the opener at home for the Hawks. So uh, there'll be a game, I'll be the one that's an exhibition, to watch in about a week. And we've arrived, folks. The season's going to begin. Please tell a friend about the podcast. Please share this podcast with anyone that you might think could enjoy it in the near future. Subscribe to the podcast anywhere you get your podcasts, places like Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts. 
YouTube, five star ratings and reviews. Follow us on Twitter slash X at Locked On Hawks or me at BT Roland. Patreon.com slash BT Roland as well. I do appreciate everybody, everybody listening. I'm sure we have a couple of folks there just now arriving again after the summer. Welcome back. The season has now officially begun and we'll have much more coming up later on this week. And uh, with all that said, we'll see you all next time.